Welcome to today's Ask Me Scott Skills webinar series. Today's presentation is the seven tests of just cause. Tracy Monahan is your presenter for today's session. My name is Sean Dale Day, and I am with the Education Department at Ask Me International. I will be your host for today's session. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping notes. We encourage you to use your telephone in order to participate in the Q&A at the end of the session. Please select Use Telephone after joining the webinar and call in using the numbers provided once you sign on. Be sure to use the audio pin shown after joining the webinar. All the participant lines will be muted throughout the presentation. Lines will be opened up for a quick Q&A at the end of today's session. If you have questions along the way, enter them into the question queue. We will stop and try to answer your questions. Please take the survey at the exit of this webinar to receive your certificate of participation. You will be sent this certificate by the end of the week. Please be reminded that this session will be recorded. I am now going to turn this session over to Tracy. Good afternoon, everybody, or good, good, evening, good morning for the people on the West Coast. I'm Tracy Monahan, and I'm a field education coordinator in the Boston area office. I'm going to be talking to you today about the seven tests of Just Cause, and I really appreciate you joining me. As part of today's session, we're hoping that you'll be able to learn to investigate a case and determine what sources of information you'll need to be able to critically analyze all that information to see whether or not management met the test of just cause, and to feel confident using the seven tests to make sure that your coworkers' rights are upheld. So what exactly is a seven test of just cause, right? As you see in this union cartoon here that according to this union contract, I can only discipline or discharge an employee with just cause. Before the union, I could do it just because I wanted to. We're lucky, as you guys probably know, as union members, we have just cause protection. That means that management must have just cause to issue discipline. They have to have sufficient and reasonable grounds. And we use these standards when we consider a discipline case. Not like us, and very unluckily, employees in non-union shops are what's known as employees at will. This means they have no just cause protection, and they can be fired at any time for any reason. So the seven tests of just cause, the basic underlining principle here is that management must have just cause. You will see it in a union um, contract. It's usually in the dis discipline and discharge article, sometimes in the grievance procedure article, but it says that management must have just cause for issuing discipline. Sometimes it says for cause, but it's all the same sort of idea. They have to have sufficient reason and they must be able to prove their case. So what exactly are the seven tests, right? Just cause has been a long-standing clause in union contracts, and the standards have developed over the years through arbitration. What we commonly know today as the seven tests were developed by arbitrator Carol Doggerty in a 1966 case. To meet the standard of being able to say that they had just cause, management, management must be able to answer yes to the following seven questions. First, we have fair notice. Was the employee adequately warned of the probable consequences of his or her conduct? So what we expect here is that employers must publicize the rules and policies that it expects employees to follow. This includes explaining the rule and describing what the penalties for breaking it would be. It's not just enough to say don't, you know, don't engage in bad behavior. You have to explain what the rule is and what the infraction would, you know, what the penalty would be for breaking it. The warning can be given orally or in printed form. Exceptions, of course, are made for certain conduct that's really egregious, insubordination, coming to work drunk, drinking on the job, stealing employer property, behavior that's so serious that the employee is expected to know that it's going to be punishable. And we all can think of examples of that. So for an example of this one, if an employee is told to stop using vulgar language and told that if he or she continues, they'll be disciplined, that may be adequate warning. However, if a boss comes up to an employee and says, I'm tired of your swearing, cut it out, and the next day fires the employee for swearing again, 
that might not be adequate warning because they had no idea that that was going to lead to a termination. Next up, reasonableness. Was the employee's rule or, reason, or order reasonably related to the efficient and safe operation of the job function? So I'm going to be honest with you. This is the one that management usually gets right. Employees are allowed to have rules that ensure safety and efficiency. And as long as they're communicated to employees, they're found to be reasonable. So for example, an extreme example really, is that a boss makes a rule that all employees must wear red t-shirts and that they must be tucked in so they don't get caught in the machinery. An employee is fired for wearing a blue t-shirt that wasn't tucked in. That was tucked in, excuse me. Making a rule that t-shirts must be tucked in so they won't get caught in machinery is reasonable, of course. And it's related to safety. But demanding that the t-shirt be blue or red isn't related to safety or efficiency. Due process. This is really two separate questions. Did management investigate before administering the discipline? And was management investigation fair and objective? So we have an expectation that management must do a full and fair investigation before administering discipline. Simply acting or just listening to one side doesn't meet the test. The investigation also needs to be fair. All witnesses need to be interviewed, all evidence reviewed and you know made a determination on. We normally expect to sit, that investigation should be done before a decision to discipline is made. Occasionally, immediate action is required. The best course on that one is to argue for paid leave for the employee pending the investigation. If they do put someone out on unpaid leave, it should be with the understanding that he or she will be restored to his or her job and paid for less time if found not guilty. So for, for example, the boss fires a worker for stealing and then demands evidence from the union that the worker isn't guilty. At the grievance meeting, the boss admits he never investigated the incident, just took in another employee's word. This probably wouldn't hold up. Or the employer claims to have done an investigation but has no actual proof that anything occurred. Although we expect management to do their job and investigate, if we have facts to prove the employee's in innocence, they should be presented to the boss, even if it wasn't properly investigated. If you have that information, you should give that to the boss. So before we go on, let's take a quick little quiz, a couple of questions for you. I'm going to describe a scenario, and then it'll be your yes or no question. So Beverly's out of work for five days. When she returns to work, management demands a doctor's note for her absence. She did not see a doctor and does not have a note. Management terminates her. The union protests the action, stating that management has never requested this type of documentation from other members. Management produces a memo from 1985, but can produce no recent documents, and Beverly was hired after that. There is just cause for discipline, yes or no. Exactly right. The no's have it. There is not fair notice. They have a memo from 1985, but Beverly started after that, and they have not used that memo to discipline anyone in that manner since that time. So there's not just cause to issue discipline. Fantastic job, you guys. All right, let's try another one. Management has a rule that employees can wear navy blue baseball caps. Most employees wear company or union hats. John shows up with a New York Yankees hat. He receives a written warning. There is just cause for discipline, yes or no. Again, the no's have it. There's, the rule says navy blue baseball caps. It doesn't say anything about writing or anything like that. People wear union hats. I mean, here in Boston, they might get discipline for a Yankees hat, but it's correct. There is not just cause to issue discipline. So, Dan was accused of stealing $25 from the register in the clerk's office. Management terminates him. During the grievance hearing, you find out that management interviewed everyone. They reviewed all of the tapes. 
security tapes, audited the cash register records, and they interviewed every witness. Management had just cause to issue discipline, yes or no? Oh, 100% right, you guys. Perfect. Yes, they had just cause. They interviewed all the witnesses. They reviewed the security tapes. They audited the cash register records. They had the proof and the evidence they needed to meet the test of just cause. So Mario was given a 10-day suspension for telling his boss to take this job and shove it and go straight to hell. Mario contends that the supervisor approached him, screaming and yelling profanities. He swears he did not respond in a derogatory manner. During the course of the grievance investigation, you find out that management only interviewed the supervisor, but refused to talk to any of the union members who were present. Management had just cause to issue discipline, yes or no. No, they did not. They, they only really took one side of the story there. They were only willing to listen to the management people and the supervisor, but didn't want to talk to any of the union members present. So that's not a fair investigation. So I think we are moving on to the next test, substantial evidence. Did the investigation produce substantial evidence or proof that the employee was guilty of the offense? So the charges must be proven by substantial and credible proof. So you got to keep in mind, of course, that this isn't a court of law. It's not like law and order. It's not going to be beyond a reasonable doubt for the most part. Instead, the standards are usually clear and convincing or a preponderance of evidence. So clear and convincing is usually used in discharge cases. And it requires that evidence is corroborated, consistent, and precise. Preponderance of evidence is satisfied if the evidence more likely than not proves the employer's case. So for example, if an incident happened, does the employer interview everyone present or only management people who are present? So that's the Mario example that we just talked about. If the employer refuses to interview non-management workers, then the investigation may not be fair. Or if they choose to ignore certain pieces of evidence, accusations need to be supported by facts. Next up, we have equal treatment. Has the employer applied its rules, orders, and penalties evenly and without discrimination? So unless there's a valid reason for a higher amount of discipline, management can't imp impose a harsher punishment against one employee than it assessed against another who committed the same offense. Employers must treat employees who engage in similar misconduct the same way. To do otherwise is known as disparate treatment. So truly, this is the most common form of workplace discrimination that we find. Here's an example. An employer issues a policy banning smoking on company property. Seven employees are caught and given one-day suspensions. Mary gets caught the next week, and she's terminated. This is disparate treatment. This actually happened in a workplace that I represented. It, and we ended up winning the arbitration because she was treated differently. Although even just one case of unequal treatment can help bolster your case, the more examples that you have, the better off you'll be. You can also look to non-bargaining unit personnel in the same workplace for examples. With attendance cases, you usually need a number of examples. So if you're trying to make your case about attendance, you want to get the records or the examples of discipline for a lot of different people. Also keep in mind that differences in service time and disciplinary records can be used by management to explain differences in discipline. So make sure you know the facts on the cases you're using as examples. Reasonableness. Was the amount of discipline reasonably related to the seriousness of the offense and the employee's past service and record? Did the punishment fit the crime, basically? So if an employee's past record, if my past record is significantly better that of my coworker, then the employer may properly give me less discipline than they, get, they give my coworker for the same offense. So the classic example that you'll mostly find on this is that two employees get into an argument and start shoving each other. One employee has 25 years service with a clean record. The other has three years service with lots of warnings and discipline. Based upon the worker's seniority and records, the employer may give the older worker less punishment than the other worker.
So I have a couple more quiz questions for you because you guys did so well and you're all getting A's on the first part of it. Okay, so we have management has a rule that employees must clock out when they leave the company property for lunch. They consistently issue written warnings for failure to punch. Victor misses a third punch out in a week and he's suspended. There is just cause to issue discipline, yes or no? Yes, 100% right, there is just cause to issue discipline. Victor did it three times in one week. It's very likely that he got a written warning, a written reprimand, and then a suspension the third time. Julie is an employee with 23 years of exemplary service and no disciplinary history. A management investigation finds that she's guilty of leaving work without finishing her tasks and leaving her paperwork incomplete. She says she had a family emergency and wasn't thinking straight. Paperwork issues are usually a first level written warning. Management issues a 10 day suspension. There was just cause to issue this level of discipline, yes or no? Right, there was not just, the UQs are awesome, you're really paying attention. There was not just cause to issue discipline. Not only did she have 23 years of exemplary service and no disciplinary history, but the investigation, you know, they found out that she had left her paperwork incomplete, but she had a family emergency, she wasn't thinking straight, and paperwork issues usually get a first level written warning. There's no reason she got a 10 day suspension. Okay. <clears throat> Mark and Charlie get into a fist fight at work. Mark's been with the company for two years and has been in a little bit of hot water over those years. He's got some discipline in his record. Charlie's been there for 23 years. He's been, he's been clean as a whistle for 15 of those 23 years. So, they get into a fist fight, Mark is fired, but Charlie is suspended and given a last chance agreement. Management had just cause to issue this discipline, yes or no? Yes, they did. They looked at the records that the two employees had, they looked at the time of service, and they looked at um, those things as a way to determine what the discipline should be. There is, you know, when you have different levels of service, different time with the company, Long-time employees with clean disciplinary records usually get more of a break than someone who's brand new and been in a lot of trouble. All right, so let's talk a little bit about using the seven tests as an outline. So we want to use them as an outline to determine whether or not the employer met the seven tests. I typically would print out a copy of the seven tests of just cause and have it with me in my in with, you know, with the contract when I went to every grievance so that I would have it right there on hand and I could just go right through them and ask the questions as to whether or not they had done a full and fair investigation, whether or not they had proof. Remember, just because the employer messes up on one of the seven tests, that this doesn't mean we automatically win, but proving that they screwed up and they didn't meet the test helps a lot. We expect discipline to be corrective, not punitive. That means that they should make every effort to correct the employee's behavior before moving on to punishment. This is why the first level discipline for so many things is an oral or written warning. You want to give people the chance to, you know, put them on notice and then hope that they correct their behavior. And nine times out of ten, most employees do. <clears throat> we view termination as a last resort, as many arbitrators do as well. It's what we call the capital punishment of the workplace. And I'm going to be honest with you, management doesn't always know the rules, even if they have fancy lawyers with them, so don't get intimidated by the suits. If you print out the copy um, from the seven, the seven tests from the Ask Me Stewart Handbook, which I believe Shondell has handed out, keep it with you. It'll give you that confidence boost you need. I've said seven tests to managers before and seen their heads spin because they don't know what I'm talking about. So don't think that they've been trained in any special way. They probably know less than we do about this stuff in a lot of cases. So when you're handling discipline and discharge cases, you want to make sure that an employee's Weingarten rights aren't or weren't violated during the employee's investigation. So I assume most of you know, but if you don't, the Weingarten rights are what allows an employee to, who has a reasonable, who's been called into a meeting with management and has a reasonable fear that it's going to lead to discipline to request a union representative. So you want to make sure that when they had the investigation that the employee's Weingarten rights weren't violated. Also keep in mind that Weingarten rights need to be asserted by the employee. It's not something that management's going to tell the employee about necessarily. Um, we will have an upcoming webinar on Weingarten rights and I encourage you to sign up for that when we have it. 
try to stop the employer from suspending or firing the worker if you can in the early stages. You want to get a cooling off period if you can. Cases become infinitely harder when a worker's out the door because not only do we have to fight about what happened, but then we have to fight over back pay, benefits, lost overtime opportunities. It just becomes more of a challenge. And I, I often felt in my years as a um, business agent that management became more entrenched in their argument the more money that it was going to cost them. When you're when you're handling discharge and discipline cases, you want to make sure you ask for all employees' notes and records they use to make a decision. Get any notes or records the foreman or supervisor may keep, even informal records. The union has a right to them. You can ask for a broad array of information, notes, employee records, copies of disciplines issued for similar infractions, which is important for disparate treatment, any and all copies of pertinent policies, names and contact information for all potential witnesses digital or electronic information, personnel files. Again, on this one, I would direct you to the Steward Handbook, which has an entire section on information requests and investigations, and even gives you some sample letters that you could use. Remember, though, that the employer has no right to the notes or records that the union makes when investigating a case. So if they try and tell you to give it to them, you don't have to. You want to make sure that you do a thorough investigation of the case. Don't take the employee's word on anything. You want to make them prove each allegation that they're charging the employee with. This means even if they, the discipline letter is two pages long and can, contains a laundry list of alleged wrongdoing, make them prove every accusation. Make them prove that they did an investigation. Make them prove that they have substantial proof. You want them to prove every allegation that they have against this employer, employee. <laughs> this one always makes me laugh because a non-union personnel hearing is uh, always in the interest of time. I'll tell you your side of the story. That sometimes happens in, in our workplaces too, but what you want to make sure is that they have the burden of proof in discipline cases. So you want to make them present all their facts and make them go first. Don't assume anything. If they start with, hey, tell me why I shouldn't fire Joe, that's not acceptable. They need to tell you, they need to give you their justification for why they want to fire Joe. The burden of proof is on them, so insist on it. They may refuse. It could happen. It's happened to me. So when that happened, I just stated for the record that they have the burden of proof in discipline cases and they should go first. And then I'd say I didn't think they had just cause and I didn't think they'd met it, and then I asked them to go. So just remember they do have the burden of proof, and in an arbitration, they will be forced to go first. So there are two parts to every discipline case. The first is, did the employee violate a known rule? And then what should the punishment be? Sometimes, honestly, and you guys probably know this, we lose the first part. The employee did violate a known rule. But then we have to make sure that the punishment fits the offense and isn't, you know, capital punishment for the first time offense. If the employer refuses to back down from a written warning and the case doesn't merit arbitration, which may happen to you, you want to make sure that the employer receives from the union a written statement disputing the facts and the discipline. They could receive it from the employee as well, but you want something disputing the facts and the discipline. And request that this letter be put into the employee's personnel file. So, before we go into any questions about this, I I like to give an example of something because I think it's it's very uh, present day and it's kind of interesting. So we have a case going on right now in the news with Tom Brady from the Patriots and people probably have opinions on it. So I'm going to start with even if you assume that something happened and even if you don't like the guy, which a lot of people don't, I don't believe that they met the seven tests of just cause to issue him discipline. They didn't meet the fair notice. There was not notice that this was an issue. They didn't have substantial proof. This is all from my perspective, of course. They didn't even-handedly apply the discipline. They didn't do a fair investigation, and I don't believe the discipline was appropriate. As far as I can tell, it was a reasonable rule, and they did a full investigation. So my point on that is that even if it's somebody that you think might have done something or it's somebody that you may not like particularly, you still want to make sure that you require management to meet the seven tests of just cause for every allegation that they have against that employee. 
because you know it's not on us to say why we're not guilty. It's on them to say why that we are or why that our members are. So do we have any questions? If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll unmute your mic. Okay, so we have a few questions in the queue. Okay. Uh, when do rules of discovery apply? Uh, rules of discovery in terms of what you are allowed to get from uh, management, what you're allowed, to, I mean, you could request a lot of information during it. Discovery is really a legal term that we deal more with information requests and things like that. So I would, I would start my information request from the very beginning. The National Labor Relations, the National Labor Relations Act and most state collective bargaining laws covering public sector workers grant the union the right to information maintained by the employer that concerns grievances. So as soon as you have a grievance, you put that information request in and you give them a specific deadline for when you want it. And if they give them a line in there that says, if you cannot meet this, please explain to me the reasons why. You may have to go further and challenge their, their refusal to give you information. But we have a right to have that information because it's part of our collective bargaining relationship. So part of the collective bargaining relationship is a fair exchange of information. So I don't use terms like you know the rules of discovery. It's really more about our their collective bargaining obligation to provide us with the information that we request. Is the employer obligated to respond to requests for information from? I think you just answered that question though. From uh, for information from union or witness statements. Are they, are they obligated to reply to our request for information? Yes, they are. Uh, as I said, most the National Labor Relations Act and private sector and most state collective bargaining laws covering public sector workers grant us the right to that information. You also may have contract language that has that information. Some, some contracts do. But part of their obligation to, as partners to a grievance process is to provide us with information on the, to um, their evidence that they have. Okay, I only have one more question in the queue. Okay. Um, is an employee required to make a statement in the initial interview? I, I mean, it depends on what the, they're required to answer questions as asked with regards to whatever the issue is. I mean, that's why you want to have a union representative present when you have an investigatory interview because the union representative can help the employee by making sure that the questions are related to what the issue is, finding out what the issue is prior to the meeting, taking caucus when need be, making sure that the employee is answering just the questions that are asked, um, huddling if need be to talk about the issue during, you know, like I said, have a caucus. So, I mean, there's there's not a, an ability to just say, I refuse to answer questions. I mean, then you become either insubordinate or possibly uncooperative, and that becomes a different issue. But I would recommend that they have a union rep present so that the union rep can find out what the issue is before you start answering questions and help to narrow the focus and keep it on track and keep notes. Okay, Irene, your phone line is unmuted. Okay. No, I just, uh, our attorney, we had this issue where they did not want to give statements that other members may have made against uh, an individual. And our attorney told us that we would not, we could not force them to give that information to us. But once we got to like a civil service hearing or something like that, they would be obligated to give it to us. So, um, you know, I find that interesting because this has always been an issue at our local. And, just in terms of witness that. statements, I mean, right. you know, I, I would start requesting them if that's something that they relied on. But at what point do you go to a civil service hearing? I mean, yeah, you actually have to go through the fourth step of the grievance process. Um, then we can determine whether we're going to go to civil service or to the hearing. So, but at the departmental level, um, you know, we had this issue. They would not give us statements that members have made or, you know, whoever made um, what they were using as evidence, they would not grant that to us. They told us we weren't entitled to it. 
And the attorney said, well, you can't get it at this level, but you will get it once you get here. Actually tried to get some language put into the contract, and we were told, you know, some locals automatically, they give them the information. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're a little reluctant. They don't want to be going and saying, hey, you're not, you know, we're not entitled to this, so we're asking for it now. So I'm just curious on that. I mean, I would, I would go back and just ask with regards to, you know, the state law that covers you and the contract language you have, because okay. it, it seems to me if they're relying on that to issue discipline, then you have a right to it. So, I agree. Yeah. I agree. But yeah. Okay. I would, I would just go back and say, listen, I have this webinar and we have this question, and I just, if you can, it seems like other people get it here in my council. Uh, you know, who also right. work for the city, could you explain why we aren't able to get it? And if it's just because right. the people don't want to give it to you, then maybe you need to take some action to force that if you're getting it other places in the city. Well, that's actually what I tried to do by going to our attorney then to see mm -hmm. what steps we could take to take action. And he told me, oh, well, you can't get it at this level, but you can get it here, so we'll get it eventually. But like you said, you don't want it to go to that point. You'd rather try to address it at the lower level. Right. So. Okay, I but like I will follow up with them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rick, if you have a microphone attached to your PC, I have unmuted your mic. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, those were my uh, initial three questions, by the way, with okay. having to do with rules of discovery and, and uh, request for information because as the previous questioner uh, mentioned, I'm in a similar uh, environment where the employer is very reluctant to release any evidence or information that they have that might bolster our case. And in, in my situation, we're dealing not just with witness statements and uh, written documentation, but also audio and video recordings mm -hmm. that that occur in the workplace, um, they they like to consider that privileged information, and um, I know there's a fair amount of legal uh, of case law with respect to the employer's claim for privilege for that information, and they have a fairly high hurdle to cross, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm to maintain that position that it is either confidential or possibly attorney uh, work product, which is even more questionable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, th this is always an uphill battle and ultimately, like, again, the previous question, uh, uh, we end up going to a mitigation hearing. The employee is still found to be in violation so then we can't really address the issue till we get to the state court of appeals or the administrative law judge. So mm -hmm. it's much further, much further in the process before you can really make that claim that they failed to provide all information that was of use to the to the union. Well, I, so without knowing your state law or your um, contract, I will say that in most places, failure by management to supply information can be grounds for an unfair labor practice charge or a prohibited practice charge depending on what state you're in. So my best advice that I've had to use in the past when I was refused information is I put my request in writing with a specific date on it and language that said if you're you know if you can't respond to this, you know, with each you know, with each bullet point, tell me with specificity why. And as they didn't, I would follow up and I would make sure that I had a paper trail of their refusal or their ignoring of it. And then I would have to file charges with either the National Labor Relations Board in the private sector or with, here in Massachusetts, the Labor Relations Commission for the state employees that I represented. Yeah, and, we're similar here in that I'm in a public sector union, so the majority yes. of, of the NLRB law doesn't apply to us in the public sector, but I understand that, that case law from NL, NLRB cases can still be relied upon obviously when it gets to court. I mean, you're not going to probably raise that issue in the administrative process, but, you know, further down the line. So, 
you know, in that regard, we're pretty much just left to whatever the Fair Labor Standard Act says about public sector employees. Well, actually, though, um, depending on what state you're in, and again, I, I don't know every state law, so I can't speak to them all, but it, at least here, it, our Chapter 150E, the state employees collective bargaining law, is mirrored on the National Labor Relations Act. I know that New York has similar language as well. So a lot of the laws that allow state collective bargaining are fairly similar to the National Labor Relations Act. So you, and I, you may have already done it, so forgive me if I'm yeah, repeating. Yeah, unfortunately, but. Maryland does not have that protection. I mean, uh, in our contract, um, our AFSCME MOU doesn't really get down into the details that much in the discipline process as far as um, the the obligation for the employer to provide that evidence. I, I, I've researched it pretty thoroughly and I don't see anything that I can point to in the contract that says that. So you pretty much have to do a little arm twisting and then hope that it'll it'll be caused later on appeal, you know, to be brought up that we weren't fully provided with all the information to to mount an adequate defense. Mm -hmm. There's not any um, public information records or laws that you can rely on? Well, not not that I know of thus far. Uh, <laughs> I realize I work for a police organization, so that yeah. Yeah. all that that implies. So you can imagine the level of secrecy that's involved when you you know disciplining civilians. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I would I would see what you can do with the state agency or something along those lines. It's my my best offer is and make sure that you have everything in writing so that if you do have to take it to a hearing or if there is a way to challenge it, that you could do it that way. Okay. And let me just re relate another interesting story that just happened literally a week ago. Um, I had an employee who was, who was charged with misconduct and um, the employer decided to hold an investigatory interview. The, the employee asked me to represent him. The investigating officer at the interview was actually a bargaining unit member. Oh, boy. Could. <laughs> now, I had a choice. This is interesting. I had a choice between protesting it and insisting that a management or supervisory employee conduct the interview or allowing it to go forward with basically a peer with a bargaining unit member. Mm -hmm. In in weighing the two choices, I opted to allow it to go forward with the the fallback position that if in the end this went against the employee on final on final discipline, I would then use that fact to our advantage to appeal it, depending mm -hmm. upon the outcome. So, I, you know, I was trying to kind of play play it to the best advantage. I don't know if you've ever seen that situation. It, it would be very unusual um, and obviously puts the employee who's investigating or conducting the interview, puts him in a very awkward position. And mm -hmm. in this case, in this case, he did it voluntarily. So it, he wasn't being compelled to do this against a fellow member, he actually volunteered to do it. And I, I did caution him that, you know, he was putting himself in a very, at very least, an awkward position with respect to the union, uh, although apparently there's no way you can bounce somebody from the union. Uh, it certainly has implications as far as him being blackballed by fellow employees for doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, the only places that I had that happen were places where I was able to protest it and get the hearing shut down because that was not the practice. Uh huh. So yeah, I mean that's because it's never comfortable. I in fact, if people if they had in hearings when they had union employees or fellow coworkers as witnesses, I always you know, demanded that they come in, they say their piece, and they leave. They couldn't stay and hear any other part of the hearing. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Rick. Thanks, Rick. It, hi. If you're requesting that information from the employer about the employee's record and they refuse to give it, is there any recourse you can take? If it's the employee that you're representing? Um, yeah, I've already gone for like our HR department and requested different employee records. 
um, to present in a grievance as a part of my investigation, and mm -hmm. they won't provide it. They just flat out refuse. Well, it depends on the state you're in, what the laws are with regards to that, but um, the employee should go with you to request it if you're having a problem getting it without the employee with you. And put that request okay. in writing. What, what okay, state so you? if the employee is with me, they can get it? Yes. Okay. Do you have language in your contract? Yes, we do. Um, and actually, um, our district rep just gave us a new form to use to officially request it rather than just sending the email yep. or appearing in person. And we've mm -hmm. done that, and they're, they've switched from refusing to just ignoring. Like, they don't even acknowledge it. Well, I would bring the employee next time I wanted one and say, I'm here with Tracy Monahan, who would like to take a, you know, take a look at her copy of her personnel file. Okay. But if you have an issue and you have a contract language and you have, um, I don't know what state you're in, so I don't know what your state law is, but if they're violating the contract by not giving employees access to their personnel files, that's a, you know, that's another grievable matter. Okay. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. Vincent Oliver wants to know, how does one assist an employee who has leveled numerous complaints against other employees, but each investigation has been determined unfounded due to lack of witnesses and evidence. So they have a problem with their coworkers. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Is he in the, is this in the queue? Yes, he says yes. Okay. So if there's not any witnesses to it, I mean, I if if he's keeping notes of what happened and raising it to management management's attention as soon as it does that can create a record of what's what's going on. I mean, if without witnesses, you you need to create the record by um, bringing those issues to management's attention or taking notes of them, like for the person, not for you. But the person should take notes of that. Um, I hate to say that they would have to start keeping a diary, but that's oftentimes what people need to do if they have to prove that there's continuation of an issue. Okay, you also done. might, I'm sorry, you also might want to find out why other people, if he said that they are witnesses to it, maybe do an investigation with them and find out why, like you go to them without that person and find out why they're reluctant to be a witness if they were there. There may be an underlying issue that you want to assist with. What should we do if shop stewards and union representatives seem unwilling to investigate complaints? Well, I always think that people should be their own advocates and, you know, if, if you were part of the case then you would know what the facts are and maybe present that to the shop steward and the um, whoever the other leader was, I forgot what you said, but I mean that would be what I would do is to say, hey, you know what, um, maybe let them know that you listened to this webinar and you know a little bit about Just Cause and you've, you've got your own case here and this is what you see and, you know, will they help you out with it? But any issues with particular people, I would say that you need to deal with that internally. Okay, Sonia Swan, your phone is unmuted. Hey, Sonia. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Okay. Now, I, I have a question. Say if the, um, the employer doesn't encourage uh, the employees to use their wine bar pipe. Yeah, you know what? Most employers don't encourage employees to use their wine garden rakes. They don't have to. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's really upon the burdens on us to educate our members that they need to affirmatively ask for it. They need to say, I, you know, I want a union. I have the wine garden right to have a union steward. Or I want to exercise my wine garden rights to get a steward or a union rep present. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's I, I there's plenty of managers who don't encourage that at all, and they they would keep completely silent on the issue. So I would encourage people to um, post it on your union boards, post it on your union websites, give people little cards that say what their union right, what their wine garden rights are so that they can always be asking for them. Because unfortunately, if you go into a case and you have not exercised your wine garden rights and they didn't tell you about them, they still can use anything that you said against you. <laughs> so it's it doesn't protect mm -hmm. you from, like, say you went in, but you didn't get your wine garden and you spilled your gut. 
that's going to be held against you in a right. court of employee. Mm -hmm. Right. We were at another facility, and um, management actually wouldn't let anybody go into the investigation without a union. But now at this new facility, they're, they discourage it, like, unbelievably. They won't release the shop steward to go well, out the investigation or anything. Well, if you're having continued issues with that, that's something I'd raise with your rep as to mm -hmm. them allowing people to be released to do wine garden rights. But, you know, you're right. There are some places where management does encourage the wine garden rights. And they're, honestly, they're smart, too. Okay, Tracy, seeing no further questions, we're going to move on. Okay. So some helpful resources for you going forward on this. Um, the Ask Me Steward Handbook, which, like I said, I believe Shondell's handed out, is a fantastic resource on this. Um, Robert Schwartz, who is one of the most beloved figures in our labor movement in terms of education, he is an attorney actually here in Massachusetts. He's got a book called Just Cause, which is all about the seven tests of just cause. He also has one called The Legal Rights of Union Stewards. Both of, and he has a number of other ones as well, but his books are fantastic. They're available at Work Rights Press. If you need information on the Weingarten Act, there, the case law specifically is the NLRB versus Weingarten. And then there's some other um, resources here as well about knowing when to keep quiet, Weingarten and the limit, limitations on representative participation, you know, knowing what your rights are in terms of representing people and what the employees' rights are. So those are some helpful resources, and I also urge you to look in your contract for anything around your discipline articles, your grievance articles, anything in there that gives you a right to information, any sort of information. I would also direct you to your state statutes or your state labor boards, and even if they have like an officer of the day, you could call up and ask the question as to whether or not, you know, what your legal rights to information are, um, and they usually are pretty helpful. So I would, that would be my suggestion for more helpful resources on this. And I really appreciate everybody's time today. You were fantastic, and I hope that you come and join one of our webinars in the future. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And as Tracy mentioned, the Ask Me Steward Handbook is um, uh, attached as a handout. You all can choose to download that uh, right here from this webinar before we exit. Um, but I want to thank you all again for joining us and thank our panelist Tracy Monahan for bringing us this well-developed information. Uh, please remember to complete the exit survey when exiting the webinar to receive your certificate of participation. And again, I want to thank everyone and please stay tuned to the Ask Me webpage, uh, along with the Facebook and Twitter pages for upcoming trainings. Uh, we're trying to bring as much information to keep our membership strong and educated. Uh, so please continue to look for these series. Thank you all.